tying that guy. I'm West Chatham and this lumberjack, the sexy lumberjack over here on the uh, I, little little people. Most people don't know this, but uh, Ty is also the model for brownie towels. Um, oh yeah, that's what he does on his side. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Frank is here joining us. Hey Timothy, we missed you. Uh, I didn't miss me. So, <laughs> how was your Christmas? I'm actually, I'm actually very disappointed that I'm here right now. How was your Christmas? It was fine. Uh, we, we got just slammed with snow like the the amount of snow that's piled up on my decks and on top of my house right now is is actually life-threatening really every now and then every now and then like a bunch of snow will fall off the roof and it sounds like a freight train like it shakes the whole house There's so much <laughs> oh my god off. yeah uh was it was it just a travel to this christmas well no so my uh my brother-in-law who has been doing a lot of the work on my house yeah um we're letting him stay in our guest room uh -huh. while he's doing the work yeah so he's been here uh -huh. and he's been trapped here so yeah oh, okay it'll be the three it's been the three of us yeah but uh the the amount of snow and ice that's on the road has caused some problems a ups truck got stuck in my driveway for six hours really like the UPS guy was just sitting out in my driveway for six hours and they called in a tow truck and the first tow truck spun out on the driveway and took out the transformer to our house and knocked our power oh, out for 24 hours shit yeah so then they had to call a second tow truck and the second tow truck managed to get the ups guy out uh but we sat here without power in a snowstorm for 24 hours so it's pretty brutal <laughs> so when the ups guy when he broke down for six hours did he come stay in your house or did you make him wait out in the truck uh, no, they're not allowed to come in the house. So uh, we offered, we said, hey, do you guys want to come in and get warm or give you coffee or whatever? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't, I mean, he was cool. He was nice, but he, he wouldn't come in. So he just sat in his truck, kept his truck running. His wife actually lived nearby. So she drove up to stay with him. So he and his wife were just sitting in his truck for like six <laughs> hours. <laughs> Did you bring him hot cocoa yeah. or anything like that? We kept offering. We were like, do you guys want coffee? You want some hot yeah. chocolate? Do you want anything? Yeah. And they kept saying no. Um, you know, I guess I don't think he I trusted. Guess maybe you. there's like some company policy or something, but I don't know. I, I just don't think he trusted you. That's yeah, he was like, <laughs> they're going to drug us and they're going to steal all the shit in my truck. He could see right through you. Yeah. Well, exciting current events is uh, we just dropped off the check to Community Brickworks that uh, we all raised for the ugly sweater, and it was it was really heartwarming. It even probably put a couple of temperature gauges on your. You're cold, dark heart, but uh, <laughs> we we videoed it, and uh, and so we'll put a video together so we can show everybody that donated and nice. see where it went and everything. They and they walked us through the their facility uh, and their food bank and everything like that. And it is the building is the fire station, city hall, and an old schoolhouse, which is now uh, community brickworks. And that I mean, this is you know, and they're serving the community, and and within this community is like. 30% is under the poverty line. So, and, and especially with COVID yeah. and all the things that are happening right now, like, you know, they're doing a lot of good and helping a lot of people. So thank you, Ty and I guy family for making the world a better place. And thank you, John McClain for inspiring us to be better men and, <laughs> and women. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 it, people should feel good about stuff like that, like yeah. contributing to help out some people. And like you said, you know, I'm, the the poorer communities covid has hit the poorer communities even harder because a lot of the jobs that got hit really hard by covid uh -huh. are lower income jobs you know i mean look if you're flipping burgers at mcdonald's you can't work from home yeah <laughs> you know it's yeah i mean that so if if your local mcdonald's cuts back on its on its employees because the volume has gone down it's not like you you know it's not like you well i'll just go work from home now yeah yeah and what, it's been brutal. What I loved about it is because I, I just called, we called him on the phone and I said, you know, I, I, we got your stuff online and we love what you guys do and we love your philosophy and uh, we want to help out. And we did this little raffle for this little sweater and uh, I just want to come and, and give you the check. But I also want to meet everybody and put it on and, and be able to show uh, all the people that contributed what, where the money's going. But I don't think they had any idea <laughs> because and so when we, when we showed up, and I was, we were talking to them, having the conversation and they're like, you know, uh, and I said, Hey, yeah, you know, we're bringing a check to drop it. I'm like, Oh God, we sure do need it because their food bank is, uh, we've been getting a lot of rain here. And so the food bank, when people are coming in the food, but where they have to set the food out is pouring down rain. So they're trying to build like a shelter over that. 
Um, so then people can come get food and it's not getting the food wet, but also the, the volunteers right. that are giving out the food are, are getting drenched. And they were like, you know, we're not going to, and, and they were talking. And then I said, you know, you know, we did the thing and then I handed them a check and they were like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, oh. and, they, and they go, this is going to help so many people. And they're like, and then they said, uh, you know, now, well, we got the, they got the shelter now and they got this and they, you know, they were making plans. And so it was such a good feeling, such a good thing. And remind, remind the audience how much they raised. 11,500. 11,500. 11,500. I mean, just the amount of power bills and food, you know, they, they feed people for a month. Uh, so people right. can come once a month and they'll feed them for the whole month. That, that 11,500 is going to go a long way. It's going to help a lot of yeah. people. And they were not expecting that. And, you know, it's a smaller community. It's a smaller town. And so, you know, I don't know if they've, you know, it was, it was, it was a really great experience. And, and, uh, there's sweet people, just lovely people that are over there working there. Well, so. I mean, if you're the kind of person who's going to spend your time and energy and money helping out those in need as like a full-time thing, you tend to be a nice person. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're a person who gives a shit. Right? Yeah. And, and one thing that really impressed me about them is they think people having access because there's not, there's not a library or anything like that in this area. Like where it's, this is South Fulton County. They put together this really impressive library. And I walked, cause when they said they had a library and everything, first of all, that, that means a lot to me. And I know it cause I mean, obviously it means a lot to you. You're a writer, but I think that like, I love books and I think books are so important. And the fact that people have this huge library with all these great works just at their fingertips and it's free for everybody. That's really impressive. You should give me their contact information because I'll have uh, Pat, our assistant, send uh, a full set of our, of our books to him. Oh, that'd be great. Put in the library. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I definitely would do that. Thanks, Ty. That's, See? that's an easy thing to do and, and Pat can get it sent out. So you, yeah, just give me the contact info for their library. You know that, uh, you know in the, gr the cartoon The Grinch when... It goes in at the beginning. Yeah. You see the X ray and you see his heart. It's the size of P. I think I think Ty's heart just grew like like the Grinch's heart. No, this think. is th this is the kind of thing I do to pretend that I'm a normal person. <laughs> uh, dude, uh, Washington is rubbing off on you. You're like a lumberjack. You're like a like a. It's uh, our house is buried in snow. I turned the heaters down a little bit because uh, we just didn't want to be like burning up like all the power in Washington state. Right. Um, so I'm just, you know, it's a little chillier in here than it normally would be. Yeah. Yeah. Plus the, the place where I've got my stuff. So the recording stuff set up, which is eventually going to be my office is on the side of the house. That is the cooler side of the house. Mm -hmm. So it's always a little cooler in here than it is. Is it cooler because that's where you spend most of your time or is it cooler? You mean yes. temperature wise? It's it, both. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. It's both. Yeah. All right. What are we talking about today? Or, or do we have any more current events? And by the way, I love that we're talking about how's your Christmas and people will probably be listening to this in March. <laughs> yeah, it's, it'll be in March. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nobody, nobody got drunk and died here yeah. on New Year's, but if, so that was good. But if you're listening to this, that means you probably just heard our Christmas special in February. Yeah. In February. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so uh, we're supposed to talk. And, now, and by the way, there are some people get really annoyed that we talk about anything other than Expanse stuff. And for all those people... Just want you to know we don't care. <laughs> we do. um, is that we're going to do it anyway? Is that true? There's people yeah. that who are you serious? Yeah, yeah there's people who get very annoyed that like this isn't a, like an expanse only podcast, uh, but we don't care. So Wait, we're, like they we're they, do they anyway. don't like uh, trimmers. They don't like that kind of stuff we do. Uh, they don't like when there's any talk at the beginning before we get into talking about the episode. Uh, they just want to skip to where the episode starts. Oh, well, yeah. so. Uh, so for all those people, skip to this moment because we're going to be talking about uh, 405, titled Oppressor. Yeah, uh, I, I directed by Jeff Wolno and written by a couple of chumps who have no business writing television. Well, one of them's uh, more of a chump than others, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> one of them's a chump in flannel. Yeah, and uh, you know, starring the usual cast of misfits and uh, reprobates. Uh, Joseph, you should put a. Like some kind of an image for the grumpy people out there that lets you know, like a the, the, where they where they know when the expanse t talk starts, so uh, they can be satisfied. I'll use Clint's head as a marker. Yeah, yeah. 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 Also, um, please cut in at some point 
the Monty Python uh, lumberjack skit. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work Which you can probably day. find on YouTube he's pretty easy. A lumberjack and he's a great okay. idea. See, whoever those grumpy people are, they're going to miss out on some great shit. Going to miss know? out on some great shit? They're going to miss out on the, the lumberjack. I wish we had a, a special channel for the grumpies, for the grumps. <laughs> and we nothing that we do other than the expanse we cut it all out. like they can't listen to anything that's fun or anything that all i have to do is just listen to the expanse and we us talk about the expanse we'll call it the grump channel yeah yeah this one you know i don't know if it's because you know it's january and it's you know snowy or whatever but i had a little existential you know angst today especially watching this one because you know, you were a, a you were a preacher boy when you were growing up. You know what that uh, Ecclesiastes when it's like no, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, there's nothing. You know, every you know exactly a, what you're talking about. Everything is. It's like you watch this. And it's like Jesus Christ. We're we're having the same squabbles, the same struggles, the same. And the, you know, the shit's going on now. If you read history, it was going in history, and it's going in the future. Like we, yep. our behavioral patterns, no matter how advanced our technology or how further along we are. We're still in the same tribal struggle, power, battling for power, squabbling over land, squabbling over rights, all these things. That shit does not change. And, no. you know, there's moments like this where I'm like, you know, every now and then. So Stephen is, has never been on social media, doesn't do social media. Stephen Strait plays Captain Holder. And then there's moments like where I'm like, he's fucking right. Like he's so right. Like he, he did. and then there's moments like this where, like, today I'm like, Ty is right. You know why I have kids? No, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing goes under the thing. We're still gonna be fighting for the same shit. We don't get enlightened. There's not a a, a civilization of Atlantis where we have now learned all the lessons and we get along fine and we were able to to cut ties with our ego and be evolved. And that doesn't exist and it never will exist. Well, no, except okay. So here's 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 my opinion on this, um, for what it's worth, is yes, we keep doing the same shit over and over again, but we make tiny incremental improvements, tiny. Like you know that whole thing of like uh, two steps forward and one step back. Yeah, the human race is more like the, a thousand steps forward and nine hundred ninety nine steps back. The, uh, but we still get that one little step. The great right? the great philosopher Paul Abdul. Coin that term. Yes. Two steps forward, one step back. Well, yeah, the what, great philosopher Paul Abdul. What? No, but see, but we get. But look, look, we are we are less likely today to just murder somebody for being gay than we were a hundred years in ago. this country. In this country, in this country, and in many other countries on the planet, you know, with a few notable exceptions, we are less likely to do that. And. Does it mean we never do that? Of course it doesn't. There's still people fucking murdering people because they're gay, even in this country. But there's less of them. So it's like uh, you look at it and you go, have we solved anything? We haven't solved anything. But what we have done is taken one tiny little step forward, tiny, tiny little step forward, right? My wife was able to go to school and get an engineering degree, and nobody gave her shit about that. And 100 years ago, there were no women in the engineering programs. So we're a tiny bit better than we were. Yeah. But so like it's little, little tiny what, improvements. But here's the thing. I'm, I'm usually the optimist. I am the incurable optimist on the show. But yeah. for whatever reason today, I'm not that because there are other countries that had great advances and were living in the light. And then they slid back or even during yeah. the fall of Rome, you know, and then falling into the Middle Ages. So sometimes but, we go all that's the way back down to go. No, that's why I'm saying the human race is a continuing cycle of a thousand steps forward and then 999 steps back. Right. It's just that over and over again. But I, I do have a little bit of hope and optimism that occasionally one of the thousand steps sticks. Mm. Occasionally one of those things, we keep it and we stay, we keep that in our collective consciousness. And so because of that, we very, very, very slowly and with lots of backsliding get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that little bit better is all we can really hope for. But it's so fragile because, you know, Marco yeah. comes along and slings some rocks at Earth and all of a sudden we're back to the Stone Age, baby. Yep. And then we got to learn everything else again. Well, and, and we saw it happen with, uh, so Daniel and I, of course, are of the age that Katrina was a huge event in our adult lives. And what you saw there is, is you know, 
the stuff that's happening on earth in, in the show and in the books really is informed by Daniel and I's experience of watching what happened with Katrina and how quickly people went to savagery, like how quickly the civilization just fell apart. And, and that, and it, that's across ethnic groups. That's across economic groups. It's not like any one group went to savagery and the others didn't. They all did. They all did. You had rich people out on the roofs of their houses with guns mm -hmm. so that people couldn't steal their stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, like, like it just immediately went to savagery. And I got to protect mine and I'll shoot people to keep people from taking water out of my house. And you know what I mean? It was like, like how quickly we went to that place. That, that's why I love the Twilight Zone monsters are doing Mulberry Street so much. Because you, the uh, power goes off one day with yeah. that, and at the very end of the, the the episode, the aliens, you know, it turns out there was aliens, and they, and in you saw this perfect 1950s wholesome neighborhood, and then power went off in some houses, and it didn't go off in others, and they would turn cars on and turn off, and it, it, it took them a night. That night, they were in full mayhem, murdering each other, ripping each other apart. And yeah. it cuts to the aliens, and they're talking. They're sitting in a ship, and he goes, "Wait, this is all you have to do is just just cut the power off." He goes, "Yeah, that's all we got to do." So we're just taking them over one neighborhood at a time, turning this off. And it's it's so true. It's like Lord of the Flies. You know, they get they get stuck on an island. And it's just we devolve so quick. So there's moments like this that I think living on planet Ty, I think makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, I, you should have your you, you kind of have a stoic wisdom about you. So like I have this like. Uh, Tolstoy, like his uh, little meditations on wisdoms every morning, but you got to have the, 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 the Frank, the, the stoic no. Frank meditations every morning. <laughs> if you're a happy nihilist like I am, <laughs> um, it's fine. But for anybody else, it just seems depressing as hell. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to depress other people. Well, have, have you ever like, have you ever read meditations, Marcus Aurelius meditations, read those? Yeah, things? I've talked about it on this show. Uh, one of Stephen and I's first long conversations. Uh-huh. We wound up hanging out at his hotel uh, after a, a press junket thing and drinking all the booze in his room till 3 a.m. Uh, just talking about Aurelius and meditations. Yeah. Because, of course, he went to a – so Stephen went to a Jesuit school, uh -huh. which was very uh, philosophy-oriented. Yeah. yeah. And so he studied meditations in school, in high school. Right. I didn't come to it until after high school, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many, there's so many pieces of that. Neither did I. That. But one of the things, yeah. and I try to read it like once a year. I mean, it, it really yeah. refreshes me in so many ways. But one of the things it talks about in the book is like if you're putting your kids to sleep at night, imagine that they won't make it through the night. And you're like, Jesus Christ. And they go, imagine we'll make it night. But if you sit there and you look at your kids and you think that if they wouldn't make it through the night, you, are, you cherish that, mo that time with them. It makes you so present. And I do... Like being present and just in the moment, I, that is such an important part of living. It's such an important yep. part of life, and it fills you up. And that's and for me, the Stoics and sp specifically Marcus Aurelius, when they when when you look at life in that way, it it's freeing to me. It's freeing to me to think that when I die, everybody will all, <laughs> my whole existence will be erased. Nothing that I do will have any impact. Nothing matters. Everything that's been done has already been done. It's uh, everything is, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, and my favorite one of Aurelius's meditations is thinking that he, he has a, I, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the, the wording, but he says that the, the longest lived person and the shortest lived person lose exactly the same thing when they die, which is this moment. Basically saying, it doesn't matter how long you live. The only moment you ever have is the one you're in right now. And that really, as a younger, as a younger adult, that really impacted me that like, that's right. This is the moment. And I've, and I've very much tried to live my life in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I bring that up because, uh, this morning, Janae and I found out a friend of ours died and he's older than us, but his wife had just retired like a couple of months ago and they were telling everybody, Oh, she's retired now. And so we can do all this stuff. We can spend all this time uh, together. And then he just died. Was it sudden? Right. Yeah, yeah, it was sudden. So it 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 really is. It, it Janae and I were talking about it this morning, just laying in bed talking about it, and that reminder that take take the time now because you might have big plans for the future. You know, the, what's the line? You know, man plans, God laughs. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, 
You don't know what's coming. Yeah, and so do it if you're not taking every moment that you have right now, if you're pushing it all off to the future, yeah. if you keep kicking that can down the road going, I'm going to enjoy my life. Then I'm going to enjoy my life. Then, then might not ever come. And then you spent your whole life without enjoying it. You know, I love listening to interviews of great people that have accomplished something great in their life or they were, and you go back and you read their like last interviews of somebody that was a president or somebody that was, yes. uh, that, you know, was really influential or a famous actor or somebody. And you go back and later in life and I, th there's a certain kind of clarity and there's a certain kind of peace they have where it's, they don't have that ambition anymore. They don't have that. And they realize like at a certain point, they're like, well, I'm fucking going to die anyway. I might have been president, but I'm going to, you know, it's, and they have that yeah. realization. And there's some people that are still hanging on. Like if you, if you watch uh, Richard Nixon's interviews, you remember that series of interviews that Richard Nixon did? They did a, uh, Ron Howard did a movie about it. Um, uh, yeah, the Frost Nixon interview. Yeah, the Frost Nixon interview. They were fantastic. 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 But you go back and you listen to these interviews and you realize that there is, it's almost like he's, he's split down the middle. There's a part of him that's like, he has been sobered and humbled by this great fall and he's been broken. And he's, you know, he says at the end, he says, you, you don't know how dark the pit is unless you've been to the mountaintop. You know, you know, and I know I butchered that, but there's a certain kind of, I mean, you know, he was a mob boss. I mean, he was possessed with power and ambition and all of these things. And he realized how worthless it all was and how, how rotten it made his soul. Um, but he's still hanging on. He's still hanging on a little bit to, you know, he's talking to me. He's like, I'm just saying if you're president, it, it doesn't have to be legal or whatever the fuck he said. And, uh, but you know, it's interesting anyway, sorry, grumpy people. We have went way off topic. Um, but we are talking about power in this episode. Oppressor is about power because it is debate between Nancy Gao and Avasarala talking about whether or not, you know, it's obviously it's secretary general election debate, but it's about what should the human race be doing and who should have the power to decide what the human race is doing. So, I mean, it fits right in because, you know, that's the whole thing with uh, Vasro's argument is the government should be limiting what humanity does with this new technology that's opened up. And Nancy's argument is, hey, it's, it exists. Humans should get to do what they want with it. And yeah, so that's why we talked about it to bring about to this, th this major debate that's happening. But what I love most about this episode and Alvis Rawls' character within this episode is that she's never ran for anything. And yeah. one of the things that's so refreshing about Ava Sarala is she says the politician subtext out loud. You know, yeah. she's never had to play that game. And she's all, you know, she's kind of her merit is where is put her in the place of power that she is now. And so now that she's got to run for something and they're trying to kind of they're trying to politician her up and she just she's incapable of being bullshit like bullshitting like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it's it, it really interesting. I mean, that, that was laugh out loud funny, that scene when they're trying to, to coach her and to get her into the political mode to go do the thing. Yeah. Well, and, and what we love about her as a character is the same thing that makes her very bad as a politician. Yeah. And it's exactly what you said that she has no filter. She, she doesn't filter what she says. She says what she thinks. And that's why we love her. But if you're running for office, if you're a politician, it is not a good trait. It you know it gets you into trouble. Have we, we see that happen? Have we ever had an American politician? Because have we ever had a politician that says what they think and means what they say? Um, I think that was more true in the early years of the country. Mm -hmm. I think I think before mass media, before the the ubiquitous mass media with radio and television, where every word out of politicians' mouth wound up on the airwaves constantly. I think people were, were more blunt. Right. I think you could get away with it. You know, you read about presidents from the first hundred years of the country and they do shit that like you would never get away. You know, you got uh, Roosevelt out, you know, like hunting bears and, and telling people to fuck off. You're never going to get away with that now. Right. Yeah. But you know, he, he just didn't I, give a fuck. Roosevelt was close. I mean, you know, you think about the man in the arena and, and how he fucking like lashed out at his critics and all that stuff. Yep. But I wonder what it would be like if there was an Ava Sarala out there that just said, just fucking said it like she meant it. And just, you know, and was not, the reality is, is that you got to be 
you're going to be a hard person to make it that high up in power. And you yep. got to be tough. You got to be mentally strong and tough. And you got to be able to do the math quick without getting emotion involved to make these big decisions. And Alva Sorella is that. So for me, if there was a politician like that, I would trust that person way more than somebody that's tying up that you can tell as being a, a politician because it, it almost like they, they don't really seem like real people because they're, they're living in so much fear because if they say the wrong thing, it could, it could tank them. And so they're just, they're just like pivoting and like, I don't want to fuck it. But if somebody just came out and was like, fucking, I don't know, I'm doing the best I can. You know, I wonder what, what kind of impact that would have or if that's ever well, happened. I mean, I, I think they would get shredded. I think they would get shredded in the press. All the things that, that you're talking about would happen to them. Uh, every word they say would get spun to make them look bad. Uh, it's just the way the, this, it's the fucked up way the system works now. You, you made me think of something and it just flew out of my head. Cut all this meandering out, Joseph, when we get to the thing. But fuck, what was I just thinking? Because you said something that made me think of uh, a thing that has just recently happened. Oh, yeah. So when I see somebody who's perfectly smooth and polished and never makes a mistake. Right here, baby. What I think is... Like you, what I think is that person has a great team. I'm not yeah. hearing them. I'm not hearing the politician. Right. What I'm hearing is there is a, a, a team propping them up that is creating the facade of what they are. Right. I don't think any words coming out of their mouth are them. Yeah. I think they are a puppet manipulated yeah. by a, a media team and a politics team and a research team right. that is crafting their message. Right. Yeah. They're just the spokes mouth. It's also, a, there's different skill sets. And sometimes people that are really great at debating and being that face and, you know, and char charisma, they're not great governors. They're not great uh, yeah. leaders uh, in, in making things happen. So it's kind of like with actors. There's some actors that can get, be very clever, very fast for auditions. They get audition, they can kind of make a choice and they kind of go and they kind of do this thing. Yeah. But that's as deep as it goes. If you're, if you're, it doesn't, and then there's some actors that aren't great at auditions that can't be clever really fast, but but they can marinate and digest, and they can have a, a deeper, honest performance than the quick and fast guys could ever have. Yeah. Um, so if there's those politicians that are really fucking good on the ball and really good on the move, but they're not, they don't have the leadership skills or the the ability to govern like somebody else that's not the schmoozer type, not that kind of like Avicerala, you know. Yeah, Ava Sorala spends none of her energy making you feel good. Like, that's not what she's about, <laughs> right. right? She she doesn't care about that at all. What she cares about is making everybody safe, mm -hmm. which is very different from making individuals feel good about themselves. Do you want to talk a little bit about the debate itself? Because I really enjoyed it uh, when Nancy yeah, got I, the main points. Uh, once again... Once again, this is largely written by Daniel. Daniel writes all of our political stuff. He writes all of our speeches. Um, I think he wrote almost all of the first draft of that debate, and then we sort of honed it down from there. But yeah, I mean, that you, what you have is two very clearly defined opposing views on what the future of humanity is. Avicerall is saying, the first time the protomolecule showed up, it tried to kill us all. Now it opened up this gate. We have no fucking clue what's on the other side of those gates. Maybe we should take a breath. Maybe we should take a moment, do a little research, send some probes through, see what's going on over there, and then build a strategy for how we want to exploit this. Nancy's position is the government doesn't own those planets. The government doesn't own those gates. Who are we to tell people what they're allowed to do with them, right? And so if humans want to go through the gates and try to establish footholds on these other worlds, why is the government allowed to tell them that they're not allowed to do that? And she's, she sees this as a potential huge boom for Earth because suddenly all these people who don't have anything to do are going to have something to do. And that's great. That's great for the economy. That's great for the you know, human psyche that suddenly the idea of exploring and building new things is, is possible. And the thing is, they're both right and they're both wrong. Well, so I, I, I'm, I'm more Team Nancy on this one than anything i think that that is right that's not uh Avastral's jurisdiction that's nobody's jurisdiction it's the frontier right and these people should be able to make the choices to 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 go and and take the chance for a better life which we've been doing since we were human beings since we walked across the land bridge the ice land bridge when all the continents were connected 
So yeah. I'm definitely team Nancy on that. And I understand what Avastaral is saying is that there could be some blowback on us, you know, like if they triggered some kind of protomolecule or whatever it comes to But look, that's not too bad. You know, that's not your, that's not in your jurisdiction or your realm of power. That, that's the way I'm, I'm team Nancy on this one. Well, and, and that is a, currently a debate. So Daniel and I, a couple of years ago, we went to Dubai uh, for a thing called the World Government Council. It's just a, a, the Emir of Dubai puts on this big conference once a year where he invites a bunch of people that are like politicians and scientists and all this stuff to talk about current, what are the inventions of today going to change about tomorrow and how can we be ready for that? And we went out because we were invited to talk about the idea of space exploitation and who owns the things in space. We fucking own the moon! Which is a big part of our book series is if you find an asteroid out in the asteroid belt that's made out of you know, titanium or platinum or some valuable metal, who owns that? Can you just go start a mining that and you get all the wealth from that? Um, do governments, are they allowed to tax that? Are they allowed to claim ownership of those things? That's an ongoing debate right now. And I, so what we're sort of bringing that debate forward into the expanse in this episode where Vasarala is asserting that the government of Earth has the right to tell its citizens that they don't own the things out there, which is, I mean, that's that's a debate going on right now. So I, I mean, it feels very, it feels very current to me. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if like commercial space travel like was a regular thing, and then people were just going like pirates, just claiming planets, <laughs> like just going <laughs> like ah, that's when you can start tie planet. That's where yeah. you go and start. It'd be like Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> like, how he has his own, his own thing, his own plan. I just um, need the godlike powers. <laughs> you know what? I would be curious. So, you know, Avasarala has that, uh, she has that ace in, in the deck where she basically calls out Nancy for, you know, using her advantages to get to the top of the list. But Nancy clearly took care of her alternates and gave them all jobs or whatever. But I, this is something that I bet that Nancy would have to uh, go over as an actress. As an actress, I bet she made the choice that she realized that she was going to be a politician and that she made the choice that she was – in this debate, whoever's doing this speech would have to know if this was a choice that you made because you knew that it was going to be something to come and get you later, so this is your way of covering it. Or you were doing it because you were motivated because you truly believed in what you said. And right. so, and, or it could be a little bit of both, but these are the kind of the interesting acting questions that I would love to ask her about is, you know, as you approach this speech to really bring it to life, you have to have a history. These words have to come from somewhere. And is this something that, and, and I think an interesting choice is that you preemptively saw this being a problem because that's how talented you are as a politician. It doesn't mean you don't believe those things. But it also right. means, you know, you can be a good person and understand the game and play the game. Well, and, and she was clearly, uh, the, the Nancy Gao character was clearly very talented and very ambitious. Because as young as she is on the show, she was already a cabinet minister in Vasarala's government. So she, she was already at a very high level in the political landscape before even the events of, you know, season four happened. So she was clearly talented. She was clearly very smart. And so that interpretation that she knew right out of the gate that this might come up as a problem later and planned for that, I would buy that. I would believe that because she was smart enough and, and ambitious enough to have you know, made those plans ahead of time. Could you explain a little bit about the, the sojourner and, uh, and the choice that Avastarella had to make and then how Nancy Gao used that against her? Yeah, so... So what happens there is uh, Marco Inaro's faction has been pirating colony ships. There's this blockade keeping colony ships from going through the ring. So you got all these ships that flew out to the ring and then or are on their way to the ring knowing that they're not going to be able to go through. And so Marco's faction has pirated a few of those ships. The Sojourner is one of those ships. And what happens is the early warning system for Earth discovers that ship flying with its transponder off, which means that it's not sending out the, the signal that every ship is supposed to send out, letting you know where it is and what its name is. It's sort of like the, the transponder signals we put on like uh, commercial jets now. 
So every jet sending out this little signal saying, I'm a 747 and I belong to United and I'm going this way. Here's my tail number, right? So that's, that's constantly being broadcast so we can keep track of everything. So spaceships are supposed to have one of those going all the time. This one is turned off, which is, makes it's illegal to do that. So you've got this great big colony ship flying at Earth at high speed with its transponder off. And they determined that if it continues on its course, it could impact some of Earth's defensive systems, some of their early warning satellites. So that's, that's what they figure out. Now, the, the question that's presented to Vasarala is, do we believe the colonists are still on that ship? Because if they are, then there's hundreds of people on that ship. And if you just blow it up arbitrarily without trying to save it, you could be killing hundreds of people. And because the radio is off and the transponder is off, they don't know the situation. Then a radio signal is sent out claiming that there is an emergency on the ship. That's an interesting complication. How they have right. It. So, so now Vassar is presented with, is that a lie intended to deceive us so that, that the ship can damage our early warning system? Or are they being honest? Is that honestly a thing that has happened? And she so has to weigh that and make the decision. Now, what tips her over to it's a lie is discovering that it was one of the ships that was reported pirated. That's when she says, oh, this is a ship that was reported pirated by the Inaros faction. That's a lie. It's an attack. Destroy it. And she makes that call. What call would you make? No, I think she was right. I mean, the minute that you realize that the ship was one of the ones that was pirated, it's obviously an attack at that point. Yeah. But yeah. even so, I mean... It could the potential of losing way more lives than the lives that are on that ship if they don't do anything about it? You know, you have to make that yeah. call. But how does Nancy yeah. Gao use this against her? Well, what Nancy's argument is, Avasarala made the right call destroying the ship, but she should never have been put in the position to make that call because if we weren't stopping colony ships from going through the ring, that ship would have never been pirated in the first place. So what she's saying is, we are creating this problem for ourselves. Yeah by not allowing these ships to go where they want to go. Right. And so that's her spin up that story. She's got a point. I don't know. Sorry, I'm struggling. I might be voting for Nancy this 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 term. Well, you um, just said you just said but you were on team of us or all of. No, I would No, no, no. So she's saying she's not saying should she have done that or not do that. She's saying that yeah. that problem is there because of our policies and because yeah. of what we're trying to control. Yeah. So I kind of wrote down a, a few debates that I really enjoyed in movies, that, just to kind of go with themes. Uh, so grumpy listeners, please tune out when I'm doing this right now. Uh, we, we'll have like a grumpy warning that's going this. <laughs> but do you remember in Annie Hall when Woody Allen was waiting in line and the guy was yeah. like bad? <laughs> yeah. He was bad mouth to Fellini, <laughs> and, and, and they were he was having a debate. And the guy didn't even know it, and then and then uh, there was, she was talking about her sex life and everything. That, that was I love that. I thought that was so so genius and so smart. I'm, um, I, so I just rewatched a movie with an amazing series of debates, and I'm curious if I'll be on your list. Uh, Tim Robbins opposite Gore Vidal uh, and Bob Roberts, uh, Denzel Washington and the Great Debaters when they when yeah. they debated against the Harvard team. Will Ferrell's debate in old school. Um, <laughs> Robert Redford and The Candidate. I, I, I enjoyed The Candidate. Did you like that movie? The Candidate, Robert Redford? Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen it in a long time. Uh, do, you, do you remember uh, in uh, Alicia Silverstone and Clueless when she was doing the, the, the Hadians, the, hate, the Hadians, when she was saying how they should have the right to come here? Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. I, I, I do not like yeah, I'm not a Clueless fan the way that you are. No. What do you mean? I, I am. I, I am not a Clueless fan. You are the biggest. You're, you're a bigger Clueless fan than Clint is a Harry Potter. Oh, are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Are we doing the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the fictional fans? Uh, Raymond Messi and uh, when he played Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Did you ever read those debates? The Lincoln-Douglas debates? I did back in school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your one? What was your thing? Uh, so I just recently rewatched 12 Angry Men. Oh, the black and white 12 Angry I Men. I should have put that one on there. Actually, that, I showed that. That may, be, that may be one of my favorite movies. I, I love that movie. And the debates between those guys, those two guys, because it winds up being two guys fighting it out for the soul of that jury. It's just fantastic. It's fantastic acting. It's a fantastic script. It's so well written. It, the the yeah. escalation of tension. 
going yep. through in the debate, and you don't, you've never even seen the guy that's on trial, but you start to really no. care about him through the yeah. way Henry Fonda does his thing. And I actually showed that to – so Jen loves courtroom dramas. That's her thing. Yeah. And so I was like, you never seen Tang to Wall Banger Men? And I showed that to her recently. And Jen, if, if it is not a now production value, meaning like even if it's in the 80s, if the production value is a little bit – she's like, oh, that's old. I don't like old. But I showed her uh, 12 Angry Men, and she was enthralled, and she loved it. And that goes to show you, good story is good fucking story, it's and that's good as story. good as it gets. Yeah, that's a good call, Ty. One of my favorite things about the debate, I put this in in season one. I, I put this in a script in season one, and it has been in every season since then, and that is Vassarala's code name with Secret Service. Uh, so I put in – so in, in season one, when the her, – her, her little ship gets destroyed by the black sky drone attack mm -hmm. and she's almost killed. We, we put in some ADR. I know, I don't know if everybody listening knows what ADR is, but ADR is where, you know, you have additional, it's, it, we use it as additional dialogue recording, although I've heard in Britain, it means something else, but it, for our production, we, it's additional dialogue recording. And it's where there, you know, there's like characters in the background who would have been saying something, but we didn't put it in the script. And so Narain will be like, uh, write something for these two Secret Service guys to say to each other in the background, right? So I was doing ADR for that episode. And he was like, the Secret Service guys on the radio should be saying stuff over the radio as they're escorting Vassar all away. And so I just wrote a couple ADR lines for the Secret Service guys. And one of the lines I wrote was, Archangel is secure. We have Archangel. And I just made that up as her code name. Because every, you know, the president always has a code name. It's never his name, right? Or her name. So I put in a Vassarala's Secret Service code name as Archangel, and Archangel has shown up in every season <laughs> of the show as her code name. So in this debate, when they rush her out of the room uh, because the attack is happening, you'll hear the Secret Service guys saying, uh, Archangel is secure. We have Archangel. So yeah, that always, every time I hear that in the background, uh, it just makes me happy. That like this throwaway thing I did for an ADR line in season one is and still it, happening. And it in lives in, in eternity. Lives in eternity now. So on Illus, the uh, the Belters are tired of the lockdown, and I tell you right now, I I sympathize with the Belters. <laughs> and if you if you would have written this back in the uh, if you would have written this during the time of the pandemic, I think the Belters would be rebelling against like if if Mercury would have make everybody wear masks. And then you're like Rivera, or, or there'd be some knucklehead who didn't want to take the LV, you know, LV coming up with the uh, blindness cure. Some knucklehead going, I don't know, I don't, I don't take blindness cure. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> I'll take my chances in the dark. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm waiting for my immune system to fight off blindness. So the Belters end up kidnapping two of the RCE guys yeah. uh, because they are trying to get the RCE to evacuate. So what is their plan? Are they are they uh, are taking them hostage and they're saying get off the planet? And then as are they leaving? Are they sending the hostages with them? Or like how are they going to work this out? I don't know that they've planned that far ahead. Okay, um, yeah. it seems it. This seems like this is obviously a bad move. This is obviously a dumb move. But I I think what you're saying is correct, which is they've reached a breaking point. They've reached a boiling point with the lockdown and with Murtry's heavy handed management of the security situation. They've just They've just had enough. Yeah. And a couple of hot headed belters decide to make this move and, you know, grab these guys and say, get off the planet and we'll send your guys up to you. I don't know that they have a plan for how yeah. they're going to actually because do that. They, Cause then they're like, <laughs> all right, well give me the, give us our guys and we'll leave. And they're like, all right, here you go. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. But yeah, it's like there, there is a flaw in that plan, but I know there it's tensions are high and it's emotional and poor yeah. Holden. You guys got him in a, in a pickle. This thing, because he's mediating between these both sides. Murdy's shooting people and murdering people. And these guys are taking hostages and his, and his, his Amos is locked up. And he has to get these people attention, but he has to reveal this knowledge that he has. But in order to do that, he's got to tell him he's been talking to a ghost. And, yeah. <laughs> and I love, you know, uh, Burn is great in this scene when, when he's like, you know, okay, you know, Miller's putting shit in my head and he's talking, he goes, so a ghost told you that this thing is waking and we're going to have to do this thing. We, and we, we come back to that joke a lot because even in season five, uh, there's a moment there where Holden is talking to Fred Johnson and explaining how he knows things uh, about, you know, what's going on with the rings. And, and Fred says, claiming to have brain damage is not the way to sell me on this. <laughs> 
But he's like, you know, Miller changed something in my brain, so now I see these monsters when I go yeah. through the ring. <laughs> and 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 Burn is like, wait, so so it's not Ghost Miller. You had a vision of the world falling apart or whatever, like just yeah. like that. And uh, and and they're going back and forth. Why is Murtry on board with this evacuation? What does he have planned? If he can get the Belters to leave the planet, that is really good for him, because then if he can just get them all to leave. Then he probably has an opportunity to keep them from ever landing. He, he certainly has a lot more control. Like, so, a lot more control. So yeah. when when Stephen's like, "Look, we got we got to evacuate this thing," he's waking, waking up. He's like, "Well, hell yeah, let's you know, yeah, hey, let's let, get out, yeah, of here. let's get out of here. We're gonna set him free because now." And is that why he's rigging the uh, the transport ship to be a bomb? So there's several things happening here. By yes. the way, that was terrible voiceover. But anyway, go ahead. When he, when he's <laughs> like, he goes, "I want you to do this, that," and he goes. So you want it to be a bomb. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? We, yeah. It should have been more of a like, you, uh, it, it, it's exposition. We know it's exposition. We're letting people know that he's building a bomb. But if he's asking a question and not making a statement, then it, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I'll come back to that because I actually have something to say about that. Okay. So there's a couple things happening here. One is if he can get all of the belters off the planet, then... He's got, he's got a better opportunity to control the situation in the future. But if he tries to keep the Belters from landing, his biggest problem, the biggest problem Byrne has is the Rocinante. It's like an M1 Abrams parked next to your village, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a huge problem. And the Edward Israel, Byrne's ship, doesn't have any guns on it, has no way to fight it. So if, if they all leave the planet and then the Belters are like, okay, the flood is passed and we're going to land again, and Byrne says, no, I'm not going to let you land. The Rossi can just go, no, we're going to let them land. Yeah. And, and there's nothing that Byrne can do about that. Yeah. So what he's planning for is, I may need to take the Rossinante out. I don't have any guns. What I have is these shuttles, and I can turn one of them into a guided bomb, and that's how I'll take it out, right? And, and he's, it's not that he's necessarily planning to attack the Rossi. It's an option. He's just saying, I have an option now. I have, I have, I have this, hit, this ace card up my sleeve. That if I need to use it, I can use it. Oh, Murdy's pretty damn clever. That's that's what his plan is. But as far as the ADR line goes, so we t I was just earlier talking about ADR line. So that line is clearly an ADR line, right? Because we didn't write any dialogue for guy on the other end of radio. Now, there's two ways an ADR line can happen. Well, there's multiple ways, but two main ways. One is the showrunner who is editing the episode. They cut the episode together and they go, "Here's a blank spot here. We need something," and then. You know, Noreen would email me or Dan Noack or Daniel and go, hey, can you, can you bang me out a couple of uh, ADR lines for these characters in this scene? And we'll just write some stuff and they'll cut it in to the edit. That's one way. And that is an editorial choice by the showrunner. The second way it happens, which is the bad way, is we get a network or studio note where somebody goes, we don't understand what's happening. Can you put an ADR line in explaining what's happening? And those are always the worst ADR lines because it always winds up being somebody explaining to the audience what's happening. But you pick your battles. You pick your battles. You be turned into a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I, yeah that motherfucker. Was, that's how we put say, the, explosion, the explosion things on it. And again, yeah. yeah. I'm going to say that that was almost certainly a note from somebody saying, could you explain what they're doing with the shuttle? That you're and filling up with bombs. <laughs> that you're filling up with bombs. <laughs> yeah. And, and, here's, and here's what happens as the season goes on. Uh, some more inside baseball stuff here. So the people who don't care about that, skip ahead. But the as the channel. season goes on, by the time we're in episode four, five, six, seven, by the time we're in those episodes, it is you are running full speed downhill and you're just hoping you don't trip over something and die. That's what's happening because we're, we're still writing scripts. We're still revising scripts and rewriting scripts. We are actually actively shooting the show. We are in editorial for some episodes because some of the episodes are being written, some of the episodes are being shot, and some of the episodes are being edited at the same time. So the showrunner who's in charge of all of those things is just trying not to die, right? He's, he's just handing stuff off to other people as much as he can. Um, and and Noreen's been pretty close to death. I've seen him some mornings. Yes. So I'm like, ah, he might not. He has pull been through. pretty close to death. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Um, so what happens is early on in the early episodes, he'll push back. Like he'll get a note from somebody going, "We don't understand. Can you write a line that says this?" 
And he'll be like, no, that's a terrible line. We're not doing that. And he'll try to come up with a more nuanced way to do it, right? That's why the ADR in the earlier episodes is better. <laughs> but by the time you get to like episode five, six, seven in there, he's so tired and he's, he just, all the fight is out of him at that point. So somebody will say, can we have an episode or can we have an ADR line in this episode saying that the shuttle's been turned into a bomb? And he's just like, fine, fuck it. ADR sure, line. Yeah. Why is the shuttle a bomb now? He's like, <laughs> you just get to the point where you've been beaten down to that level. Bless his heart. Um, you just don't want to, you just don't want to yeah. fight anymore at some point. But you know what I love about this is, is it's clear burn or Morty is clearly we clearly perceive him as the antagonist. We think he's got yeah. good points and everything, but he is definitely the antagonist force in this. But he's fucking right. You see in the flashback scene in the beginning that Coop did blow up the goddamn Coop thing. Did blow up the yeah, thing. and he yep. was. And blew, Coop did deserve to get shot in the face. And he, Coop did kill all his people. And, and, yep. I, and I love how you addressed it. I don't think it was in this episode. I think it was the last episode. It might have been this episode when he says... Uh, what is it about me? Is it my face? Like, why? <laughs> because it's so true. Like, he is clearly the bad guy. That is right all the time. And you're like, yeah, you're right, but still fuck you. You know? And, yeah. you know, uh, the reality is, is, uh, Lucia was with them. You know, she yeah. was, I mean, she was, she was on board for the let's blow up the landing pad part of the plan. Yes. Now, but because, because if we can blow up the landing pad, we can keep them from landing their heavy shuttle and, that will slow down them trying to take over the planet. She right. was on board for that part. Yeah. Um, what but, she was not on board for was let's kill all the people in the shuttle. Yeah. And so yeah. she tried to back out and coop through her and she got knocked out. But the thing yeah. is, from Morty's point of view, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know what he happened. Doesn't know that. But he does know she was there and he does know that they were fucking blew up the thing and try to kill him. Yep. Yeah. You know, and so she's now on the Rossinante and Holden's like, no, no, and, and taking her now. She's up in orbit and he's like, she fucking tried to kill me. Like, nobody's listening to me. And who the fuck are you, Holden? Come here. I got the, yeah. the, the thing here. Yeah. Well, and our show, one thing we consistently do with the show, and it, this actually is a positive and a negative, because the people who like this kind of storytelling love the show to death. They're our right. biggest fans. But the people who want white hats and black hats, the people who want, at the beginning of the episode, we realize that's the bad guy. And we're just waiting for the hero to punch him out on a catwalk, right? The yeah. people who like that kind of storytelling do not like our show because they're yeah. confused by it. They, well, well, who's the bad guy? I don't understand who the bad guy is. Every time we set somebody up to be the obvious bad guy with no redeeming thing, then we show you why they're redeemed. We show you why they actually have good points. And, and there are some people who really don't like that kind of storytelling. They don't like having the tables turned on them. They don't like being forced to empathize with who they thought the bad guy was. Right. And so that's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it, it does well, to some but, degree but, limit our audience. But here's the thing. I'm pretty sure those people that like the black hat and the white hat are the same grumpy people that doesn't want us to talk about anything <laughs> but the expanse. And so, you know, I, I understand that. But here's the thing that they don't know. What the actors do, even if they are black hat and white hat movies, the actors are playing it so if you didn't give Byrne, who plays Morty, all of these interesting things of, of justifications why he's doing it, and he's just a pure uh, antagonist that is there and he's a pure evil guy, yeah. Byrne, the actor, will then put all this in anyway. So there is no, from an actor's point of view, there is no black hats. You have to justify what yeah. you're doing. You have to see, or you yeah. can't play it. Evil is and not I, a thing to play. I think the caveat to that is good actors do that good actors do that good actors because do that. and burn and burn is a good actor so he uh, he and i had conversations where he would ask me he would say am i doing this because of this thing is this is this the reason why is you know because he needed that exactly what you're talking about he needed to understand why you know murphy was making the choices he was making yeah i mean if you Look at Die Hard. I mean, Alan Rickman is George Clooney on Ocean's Eleven, who's who's doing a, who's doing a heist. Yeah. You know what yep. I'm saying? In his point of view, he has got to see it that clearly. He is the hero of that movie, yep. and 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 he's running this thing. And John McClane is the guy that's fucking his shit up. Yep. And what happens is what the trap is. And if you've seen, like, there's been 80 Die Hard copies. Nobody's as interesting as Alan Rickman because they're playing the evil guy. They're playing the yeah, they're, evil guy. They're that's cackling and twisting their mustache. Right. Yeah. Right. I would say the one 
exception. And the reason is it's because it's Tommy Lee fucking Jones. As I think under siege, I think the bad guy's more interesting than good. I mean, Steven Seagal is just Steven Seagal. He has one thing he can do. He just plays that one thing. Tommy Lee Jones Steals as the them. CIA guy who got burned and is now trying to take revenge by stealing their nuclear shit. He's fucking fascinating. He's fascinating because he's a great fucking actor who's he's doing a he, great. And, actor. I, and I guarantee you, Tommy Lee Jones is really justified why he's doing what he's doing. That's why he's yeah. so compelling to watch. So there's compelling. that there's a moment in that movie where he's talking to the CIA guys over the radio back in, you know, whatever, whatever place, the, those, the big table, all the guys are sitting around. And, he's, and he just has this moment where he's like making jokes and, and taunting them and, and tossing out little one-liners. And then he ends it by going, you tried to kill me, you son of a bitch. And that's the moment where we hear his actual, that's him. That's, that's, that's the only honest moment. Uh. Yeah, that, he's been teasing him and joking around. But he's so mad that they tried to kill him that it has motivated everything he's doing. And you can tell it in that one line. The delivery of that one line tells you his whole story. And here's the thing. There's like 183 Steven Seagal movies. But yep. this, is, this is what a great actor will do. You'll never forget that. You'll never forget that performance. And there's a reason why. There's 183 bad guys in Steven Seagal movies. But who yeah. are we talking and nobody about? has any idea who they are. And nobody has any idea who they are. But Tommy Lee Jones comes on and does the traditional Steven Seagal movie, and he, and he elevates it to a level that, I mean, part of the success of Die Hard is Alan Rickman, you know, yep. and that, that kind of work. What do, you, that, what do you mean part of? I would say it's 50-50, man. Well, like, that's, as much credit that's as a you part. give Bruce. Yeah, I, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, like, yeah, part. I agree that it's a part. I think it's a huge part. I yeah. think it's like a 50% massive part. Yeah. part. So yep. when you say part, you mean that there's a part. So 50% part. I, I'm guy, agreeing with you. Part. Okay. All right. All right. Half Rickman, <laughs> half Reginald Val Johnson. Oh, look who decided to show up. Yeah. Fucking diva this guy is. Um, now, we, we, when, when he shows up late like this, we dock his pay, right? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to dock nothing. So he actually has to pay us when he's late. So, uh, I await my check, Clint. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Venmo, it's on its way. Have we talked about uh, Rosa Gilmore's work in this yet? We have talked about it a little bit, but we can talk about it some more because she's great. And in this episode, she really yeah. starts to shine. This is where her character yeah. really starts to uh, break loose. And, and she's an excellent actress. She does excellent work in this. And, uh, but I will say, I agree with her fucking husband in this conversation they have here because she went... To blow up this ramp with the ships coming, she didn't fucking tell her husband, you know, because it's one thing if she told him and she's like, I'm going to do it anyway, but, but at least give him the heads up. I mean, you know what I'm now, saying? Okay. Now, I, I will say that what she is doing here is what men have done in marriages from time immemorial, which is you don't tell your wife something if you think she's going to say no, right? You, like you, you weigh it in your head. You go, if I say I'm going to do this, my wife's going to tell me no. So I'm just not going to tell her and then I'll apologize later. That's what she's doing here. We're just giving her the male part of it. The male trope part of it. Yeah. And it, we're giving it, her the part where she's like, I know my husband will say no if I tell him I'm doing this. So I'm just going to do it and apologize later. But it's still wrong. It's oh, it's still totally wrong. wrong. It's, still it's wrong total. I'm not because, saying it's right. Yeah. I'm just saying because there's dudes two have been doing this for like the big since the beginning of time. Because there's two conversations to be had. Right. So if she says, listen, I'm going to do this and this is really important to me, but I'm going to tell you. And then him saying, well, you can't do that. Then her doing that, that's a different conversation. But yeah. for her to go do this and not tell her husband that like, you know, I mean, imagine if Janae was like, hey, by the way, I blew up our neighbor's house down the street. I just they like they were annoying me. The music was on everything. You'd be like, I don't care that you blew them up, but fucking cue me in on it because maybe I can help you get away with it. You know, maybe I can help you, you know, because Janae is so logical and methodical she has such an engineer brain if she blew up her neighbor's house i would assume she had a really good reason so you just you wouldn't even you'd be like okay honey i just, I just and, back and, her play yeah, i would just, just back her play yeah i would back I, her play but i think this guy has some legitimate gripes he doesn't know where his fucking daughter is yeah and and his wife was is a part of this terrorist action and now she's up in orbit and and ross and Nante, like i i can i can i can identify with it but i will say i don't see 
this couple together? They must have gotten together when, when like, it must have been a college or high school romance and they just stayed together too long because there, I don't see attraction or chemistry there. What? I, I don't, do you? I do, actually. So, so here's the hidden story of that couple. Okay. Uh, which we never, we and, never. And, and by the way, I want to say the, uh, because the actor's terrific, and I'm drawing a blank on his name. The, the guy that plays her husband's very good in this, and he does it in a way that's so good that that's why I don't see how that they were ended up together. Um, that is because uh, she calls she calls him weak. You know, she's like somebody's got to do fucking something when he's getting on to her. But yes, he is he is a great actor, and um, here's the hidden story of them. So she's got a bunch of tattoos, Belter style tattoos. That he doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about with uh, the hair and makeup people is, and and the reason why she's out helping blow up that stand and he isn't, is she had a rowdy childhood. Or not childhood, but she was was rowdy Mm -hmm. as a a younger woman. Mm -hmm. Um, Think of like Naomi running with, you know, the Inaros faction when she was younger, when she was hanging out with Marco. You get the sense that, that Lucia was that had that kind of t- teenage years where she right. was rowdy. She was, she was running with the OPA, some faction of the OPA. She was a bomb thrower. Right. 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 And what her husband represents to her is peace and stability. Cause a lot of times when people, when people leave that, so when they get out of that sort of violent past, they go looking for somebody who's the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And, and what, uh, uh, oh, Stephen McCarthy. Thank you. Stephen McCarthy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Joseph. Great so Stephen words. McCarthy, okay. the actor. Um, so what I see with, with Lucia and, and her husband is she left this rowdy past she had behind. And what she wanted was stability and quiet and peacefulness. And he is all of those things. He's, he's a gentle man. He's, you know, he's, not, he's not a violent man. He was probably a great father. To their daughter really yeah, obviously he really loves the daughter like that's what i see with the two of them is is her looking for that sort of peace and stability in her married life and and i think they fit together perfectly in that way well i think maybe in peaceful times that would work but if shit hits yeah. the fan she's reverting back to like the, the, she is her she's reverting back to who she used to be yeah. and and he he's like what are you he doing? doesn't he doesn't have that in him he doesn't have it in him and that's he why have and that's him. what and she he says, says to him brought the killing here he doesn't have it he doesn't have the violence and the killing he, and she's like somebody's got to fucking do something because you're not going to do anything because you don't have that gear here's the thing that we like to do on the show that sometimes confuses people is we like to flip the roles, uh, ethnically, gender-wise, uh, philosophy-wise, we have to flip it. She is playing the traditionally masculine role in this story, in this couple. Mm-hmm. And he's playing the traditionally feminine role, the tropey feminine role, where he's much more about protecting the family and taking care of the daughter and living in peace. And she's the one with the violent past who, when violence shows up, she gra- she jumps in and starts committing the violent things. If we flipped the genders here, nobody would be confused by it mm-hmm. because it's, it's, we expect to see it that way. Mm-hmm. And I think where the confusion comes in is because Lucy is a woman and I'm her, not, you know, yeah. And I, and to be fair, I'm not confused. I, I no, totally no, but I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, you. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about like, so, you know, we get some people who are, are a little confused by that. I'm not, I, I, yeah, I, I totally understand what's going on. I, just don't see them together but it makes a little bit more sense you talk about that he's this piece in this you know in the thing that they had before it though i think the moment that you get the family version of that and where you do see why they're together is that moment where alex is in and he's kind of hitting on her and then uh her husband and daughter show up and 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 lucia introduces them she has a real warmth in her voice when she introduces them and Mm -hmm. And her husband has a real warmth when he invites Alex to have dinner with them. Mm -hmm. And you get to see sort of that's what they were. Mm -hmm. That's what the three of them were is is that warmth and that sort of family kind of feel that quickly goes away because of all the crazy shit that happens. But you get that moment of them. Yeah. So the argument between them is so vicious. She rips her stitches open her internal sutras. And uh, uh, did I say sutras? (laughs) 
You did. <laughs> I, th- I, mean, I thought maybe you were doing the French version. <laughs> and, and her, com- her Kama Sutras. And, uh, <laughs> and um, she starts bleeding. Now, is she making the decision to kill herself? Is yeah. she saying? And why is she doing that? Because, because she feels like she's lost everything. But she, feels she doesn't like- know where her daughter is. I mean, wouldn't she... Wouldn't she make sure she knew what, her, what happened to her daughter and if her daughter's okay and if she can help her or not before but, she but does she, that? But she feels helpless. Mm-hmm. She feels helpless. She's trapped on the Rocinante. She can't leave. Nobody's listening to her anymore. Her husband is basically telling her to fuck off and cut ties with her. It's a moment of despair. It's a moment of despair. You know, she's, she's being blamed for these murders. She's kind of blaming herself for the murders too. All of her friends have been killed by by Murtry. If she ever goes back down to the planet again, she's going to be arrested or murdered by Murtry. She has this moment. She's like, I'm never going to see my family again. My daughter's missing and I have no way to find her. I have no way to help it. You know, you understand why she has a moment of despair there. Yeah. I, yeah, I, th- I, I think a parent, you know, there is a, like, if the daughter was with, uh, you know, was safe or with the husband or whatever, like I can understand it. But as soon as something is missing or not right or whatever, that then becomes your focus. Like, all right, I got to get off this fucking ship. I got to survive. I got to figure out what's happening. I, but I could also see very much why she would leap to the idea that Murtry has either kidnapped or killed the daughter. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And if that's true, then that's her fault in her head. Mm-hmm. Whatever, happened, whatever has happened to Felsia is Lucia's fault in her head. Yeah. And how you compared it to Naomi earlier is interesting because Naomi comes in and, and explains her situation where she was suicidal when she lost her yeah. kid and, and, and they have a similar past to each other. Kind of. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, when we're talking about the secret history of Lucia, that's part of why you have that moment there because of all the people on the show, Naomi is the one who understands. Mm-hmm. She's like, yeah, I was there, man. I used to be a bomb thrower. I used to do the shit that you're blaming yourself for right now. I also lost a kid. You know, I, She's the only one on the ship who understands where Lucia is. Yeah. Kind of like I'm the only one that understands you. Yes. So then there's two massive fucking explosions at the end. And you, you know, I, I, it always sticks in my head when you said that, that what Daniel said that one time where you want an episode to end and you want people to ask what happens next, not what happened. Because yeah. you do a good job throughout the whole episode of setting up with this, this thing that's happening, and then it happens at the end. Now you're like, what the fuck's going to happen now going right. forward? And you even got, you even got a, little, a little tip off of the booger eye, a little green <laughs> eye going on. A so, little, little green eye going. Yeah, green eye going on. So, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of great standoffs in this episode. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to kind of go through our favorite standoffs in movies. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I, I wrote a few down. You want to hear them? And we'll try to do, I do. The top five. All right. I do want to hear, them. uh, Butch casting the Sundance kid at the end, the last standoff at the end, the RoboCop and the drug factory. <laughs> when he goes in the dirt. <laughs> is that um, even a standoff or is that just a murder spree? Well, it's a standoff in the beginning. Cause he comes in and you remember he's doing that speech of like, you know, I don't want any trouble and all that shit. And then they're like, yeah. and they just start fucking unloading on him. And then he goes, uh, good and bad and ugly is the classic standoff. Did you ever see the sequel to Boondock Sanks? I, I did. It was not very good. It's not good, but there's a cool standoff where the dad has, he takes the bullet and puts it in the chamber and then they have a gun and, they're, and he puts the gun to his head and they, they're shooting at each other. I thought that was a cool standoff. Uh, the Three Kings, the standoff where, where they shoot the lady and then George yeah. Clooney, he can't leave and then he goes back to that standoff. Uh, Sean and the Dead, when the guy's about to shoot his mom. And that's another, and, and then the, the guy puts a bottle to his neck and they have the gun. And she's like, look, that, we can't really go into this right now. But that's a, <laughs> you know, that's a great example of something that's really funny. That they do such a good job. Like, this is very funny, but there's real tension in the standoff. And it's fucking heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. When he kills his yeah. mom. I, I, I would add, you know, you brought up Hot Fuzz earlier. Uh, uh, but, you know, it was... It wasn't actually Hot Fuzz you were talking about. Yeah. But in Hot Fuzz, when uh, our two main characters take on the entire Citizens Council of that little village, that's a, a pretty epic standoff. That is a good standoff. That is a good standoff. And that, that'll go in there because that could, that could make a top five. Uh, the Pumpkin and Bunny standoff in Pulp Fiction. 
<laughs> and actually, Tarantino is a master of this. I have a, a lot of Tarantino on this list. A uh, face off when they're in the 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 mirror room and they're in mm-hmm. the, and they stand next to me. He's talking about how he likes to bang his wife, and then they have this thing. And then um, Tra- Travolta was really good in in face off. That was he was great in that. Urban Cowboy and Travolta. That's top Travolta. Reservoir Dogs, the classic standoff where they all shoot each other down the chain. That was great. That's again Tarantino and Glorious Bastards with Michael Fassbender and they're sitting at the table. Yeah, what a, what a great scene that is. That that face off between uh, Billy Zabka and uh, Daniel Larusso at the end of Karate Kid is a pretty great face off. Or the face off and uh, the beginning of Karate Kid too when he Mr. Miyagi faces off with the Cobra Kai yeah. uh, guy and he punches through the window. Remember that? <laughs> breaks his hands on the yeah, window. Breaks his hand on the window. I uh, did Reservoir Dogs and Glorious Bass. Oh, another Tarantino, True Romance. At the end, when he, when he's like, Boris, shut the fuck up. These are cops. You know, <laughs> shut the fuck up, Boris. He's like, there's something I never told you. I don't like cops. Yep. Did you ever see uh, Seven Psychopaths? I did, yeah. <laughs> you remember when he, when he takes the, uh, the flare gun to, to Bonnie's, the little dog's head, and Woody Harrelson's yep. like, Bonnie? <laughs> Okay, uh, now if you're gonna bring up, if you're gonna bring up uh, True Romance, the greatest face-off in that movie. Oh yeah, is Christopher Walken and um, uh, fuck, why does his name just fly out of my head? Dennis uh, Hopper. The, Dennis Hopper. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Christopher Walken, and Dennis Hopper. Yeah, uh, the best face-off in that entire movie. When you die, I want you to tell the angels in heaven that you've never seen evil so singularly personified in the eyes of the man who's going to kill you. Yeah, Christopher Walken's fucking awesome, man. I love that scene. That's a good scene, and I'm de- I'm uh, a little ashamed that I that I forgot about it. Uh, Matrix Revolutions, you know, you remember that one where they're they you're gonna make a deal when they're on the thing, and he's like, "Do you love them that much?" Um, Desperado, which the whole movie's a standoff. Yeah, everything uh, in Desperado is a standoff. A standoff. Uh, do you ever see the Killer John Woo movie, The Killer? I was gonna bring up The Killer. I was also gonna bring up Hard Boiled. Which has an amazing standoff. In it. Ooh, I would say I forgot. That I would one. say anything, anything John Woo made is a standoff movie. And I would add to that the corollary to that is anything Chow Yun Fat has ever been in is a standoff movie. <laughs> yeah, Chow Yun Fat only plays characters who get in standoffs. That's all he does. Do you remember the uh, movie Battle Royale? It's like a, in a high school. Yeah, uh, yeah. I love that movie. Uh, it, my love of that movie made me really dislike Hunger Games. <laughs> oh, because because they they were there first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and by no no offense, I know you you made a hundred million dollars being in Hunger Games movies. So <laughs> I I no offense to you, man. The uh, alien standoff at the end of Aliens, where she has the blowtorch and the and the and the aliens coming at her, and she like May, maybe maybe one of the greatest standoffs oh, of all time. And so and here's the great. thing: is it's one long standoff because yeah. it's the standoff at the beginning with the gun and the flamethrower and it evolves into the standoff with the power loader. Right. And so it's just, it's and just it, the whole last third of that movie is a standoff. And so he, this is what I, I love so much about these movies. And what I love about this aliens in particular is the aliens are so far advanced. They have all the advantages that you just feel so powerless watching. That's why it's fucking yeah. terrifying. And anytime yep. I see a movie where you're just so powerless and all of a sudden that you get a little bit of power, you get a little leverage over them. It's, fucking it just feels like a drug and so when she's pointing the blowtorch at the eggs and then the queen's like ah and she yep. te- tells the other guys to back off and they're slowly backing off in their little yep. tunnels and you're like god damn right you fucking <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so can, can i add to that then that i think the entire last sequence of terminator where it's sarah connor and and oh, yeah. and um yeah i was gonna say hicks <laughs> <laughs> Sir Connor, Sir Connor, and uh, Kyle Reese facing Kyle Reese. off with the turn Terminator, um, and the two that standoff between the three of them is amazing. Yeah, and it just you know that the and the way it evolves and the turns that it takes and the reversals and yeah, yeah. There's a whole three act structure in that that final chase scene in its in yeah. itself. You know, yeah. and and I think great action scenes act like there's a structure to it. You know. And we've talked about this so many times about fight consistency and everything like that. And that's, that's one thing that Aliens and Terminator get right. Like, this yeah. thing's indestructible. And, and you know it's indestructible. And they're kicking everybody's ass for, you know, 99% of the movie. 
yeah. then there's some way or somehow you figure something out. And then it's terrifying and it makes sense. And you, when she pushes that crusher and she's like, you're terminated, fucker. It's yeah. like she's been through, she's pushed to the very existence of her being to get to yeah. that point, and then you're with it, and then she pushed that thing, and so that's good. It's not like the new Star Wars where they, every time the Terminator shows up, they get in a fight, and they, oh, who's going to win, Terminator or Kyle Reese? It's not as happening. It's like, no, oh, fucking Terminator is, is, is Mike Myers from Halloween. Like, you can't, there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. Of course, John McClane with the gun tapped to his neck. That's oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that Fantastic. Great. That was really good. Oh, <laughs> Do you remember the the standoff in the naked gun <laughs> when, they're, when they're at the baseball stadium and uh, and and he's got uh, Priscilla Presley. He got the he's got the gun. The bad guy's got the gun or whatever. And then he goes, "I'm not going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot him." And then Leslie Nielsen thinks, and then he takes his own hostage and puts <laughs> the thing. And he's holding somebody like this, like he just grabs a random person, like walking by. <laughs> Oh, uh, speed the elevator fight the elevator standoff and the and speed um the thing with Kurt Russell when he has the dynamite and that blowtorch and they're going yep. back and forth that was pretty cool I, and, and if you're going to do elevator standoffs you have to include uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, John Malkovich in the elevator in uh, Line of Fire oh that's a good call forgot about that one John Malkovich another one of all right so what's our top five this is a tough one. Okay, so uh, for me, uh, oh, and also, um, you know, you didn't include Ripley and the alien from the first Alien movie. What, when they're on the transport ship? Yeah, when they're on the little shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a standoff, though? Yeah, it is, because she has to, she's trying to, it's, you know, it's that moment of, like, trying to, like, get to where you actually have a chance against this thing that has just murdered everybody. I mean, and then she winds up finding a way to win. I, I think this is pretty much a standoff. I think uh, the good, bad, and the ugly is got. I mean, that's it's got to be number one because it's one of the great standoffs in film history. I would agree with that. It is one of the great standoffs in film history. Uh, I would also do. Uh, I mean, that whole series because Fistful of Dollars has the standoff between him and the guy with the rifle, and he he has the metal thing. No, I messed uh, up. I messed up. Sorry. No, I, Fistful of Dollars for me is the favorite standoff in the trilogy. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. the well, because Good, Bad, and the Ugly has the t- three way standoff. Yeah, but the the when him getting shot and he had the the oven the thing on it, you know, like yep. me me and Biff love that scene. It's just genius, just fucking yeah. genius. Well, you know, in many ways, I've always thought you are basically Biff Tan. <laughs> I mean, you're you're like the live action version of Biff Tan, I think. The, first of all. I love you and fuck you for getting that in one grip. You, you just, uh, mine automatically went to Back to Future 2 and you saw Biff go like, fucking beautiful, beautiful, fucking so smart. Yeah, I, I agree that that standoff, uh, because it's set up, that standoff, that moment is set up for the entire movie. It starts out with him, the antagonist, talking about how the man with the rifle will always beat the man with the pistol, you know, shooting that, that suit of shooting the holes in that suit of armor, like it's so perfectly set up. And then by the time you get to the end, those two men hate each other. You know, they just they just want the other one to die. And that moment where he shoots him, and then Clint gets back up again, and he's like, like uh, "What is happening yeah. here?" Unloads the rifle into him. I mean, it's so perfectly crafted that that whole thing. I'm a I'm I I like Fistful Dollars way more than I do Good, Bad, and the Ugly. I'm a bigger fan. It, of that. Well, Fistful of Dollars, you know, created basically created a genre. Yeah, it's so. I mean, what it's, What do you think Zemeckis was saying about Biff that he was such a fan of that scene? Because Zemeckis is a smart filmmaker. Nothing is throwaway. Everything means something. I and think. So, I I think that that is so. The the all those Leone Italian, uh, you know, the spaghetti westerns. They're, they are the height of macho filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Everybody in those movies is so fucking macho, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, the bad guys are macho. Clint is like apex macho. Like yeah. there's, no, there's no level of macho above fistful of dollars Clint Eastwood macho, right? They, like what is above that? Nothing, right? Ripley and the alien queen has got to be in my top five. And I forgot uh, about Tombstone. Fistful of dollars in my top five. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was just about to say the the for me that you know Hicks versus uh, uh, Doc Holliday, one of the great standoffs. Uh, no, I meant Kyle Reese. Kyle Reese versus Doc Holliday. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of the um, great standoffs. We need to do a. a we need to do top three. Um, and and of course die and of course die hard is gets the zero position yeah. with uh you know Bruce Willis versus uh right so die hard fistful of dollars rip ripley in the alien queen uh tombstone um Kyle Reese versus uh the longer yep so four i think i think uh inglorious bastards should be on there that that scene in the bar is is one Masterful. of the great scenes yeah it is that is a masterful scene for sure. And then uh, one more, and then we're done. Mm. Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. We don't I, want to add more to the list, but the thing that just popped into my head is one of my favorite standoffs of all time, and I didn't bring it up. Do you ever see the movie um, Coffee with uh, Pam Greer? Mm -mm. There's a scene in there where she's facing off with two drug dealers who uh, sold drugs to her, her brother who died. And she's got a shotgun, a double barrel shotgun. And she shoots one of them and blows his head off. And then she turns to the other guy and she says, this is going to be worse for you because he didn't think I, I would do it. You know, I'm going to. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> That's yeah. one of my favorite standoff scenes ever. I, even you telling me the story makes me love that. So we could put that on there. Pam Greer. I would, I, that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite standoffs of all time because I just love the line. He didn't think I was going to do it. But you know I'm going to. Yeah, maybe Joseph can somehow get the scene in there. Get that. I clip. swear, guys, it's like yeah. you never watch our shows. Of course, the clip will be in there. Well, thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, we love you. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.